For your viewing pleasure, we've gathered some of the most intriguing news today. We're delighted to have you here, whether you've been a subscriber for a while or are just now discovering our channel. If you missed any of our earlier films, don't worry, we've got you covered. Let us take you on a journey through some of the most amazing stories you'll ever hear as you sit back and unwind. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel if you like what you watch to see more engrossing stuff. Additionally, if you have any suggestions for your favorite stories, do let us know in the the comment section below. What's the creepiest declassified documents? Viewers edition. Hey folks, quick content warning. Uh, these are some pretty messed up uh, documents, some of them, and they might talk about abuse, uh, some descriptions of some graphic violence, some pretty heinous stuff. And so if you're not comfortable hearing that, uh, just prepare yourself or you may even want to skip this video. Story 1. Not as much as declassified file as much as it is a horror story involving the military. An Arizona man's mother passed away from Alzheimer's, so her son decided to donate her body to the Biological Research Center, under the understanding her body would be used for research purposes. After the research was done, she was to be cremated and her ashes sent to her son. A man by the name of Stephen Gore, ironic, at the BRC sold his mother's body to the military for explosive testing. Her, among many other deceased people, were diced up and sold for profit across the world. They even had a price list for individual body parts like torsos, arms, knees, etc. One lawyer is quoted as saying, They said we found your father's head in Florida, or say we think their body went to the human market in Southeast Asia. Her body was blown up, strapped down to a seat. The military, it said, f was for understanding how IEDs affect the human body. FBI agents are quoted as saying they saw buckets of human heads, arms, legs, and male genitalia in coolers. They even hung one large man on a wall and replaced his head with that of a small woman, seen in a Frankenstein manner, described as a morbid joke. One agent named Parker recalled carrying around body bags whose contents sloshed around inside and leaked onto his pants and shoes. That agent retired with PTSD. The FBI also said there were several other body donating facilities under investigation for the same atrocities. Gore was prosecuted and convicted for illegal control of an enterprise. He was sentenced to one year of deferred jail time and four years of probation. The mother, Doris Stauffer, could not be laid to rest because her ashes were mixed with other pe deceased people's ashes. And the son, Jim Stauffer, was one of multiple plaintiffs that sued BRC in 2014. Yeah, that's uh, kind of horrifying. Most of us who put down somewhere that we'd like our body donated to science would like to think that it's being put to some kind of positive use to help better something in medicine or something like that. And while sometimes the contribution might be really, really minuscule, have hearing that body parts are being like sold to these markets and defiled and stuff like this, really just kind of, you know, it makes you question whether or not that's even worthwhile now, which is unfortunate because I'm sure some adva good advancements have come from bodies donated to science. Story 2. In the 50s, President Eisenhower came to distrust our own military. Their military became too independent and sought its own goals. Fearing losing control of our nuclear weapons, we put a three-part verification in each nuclear warhead. The person manning the warhead had one code, the president had the second code, a third party who acted as a failsafe had the third code. And the invent a faction of the military went rogue, they at least could never start World War III. Eisenhower were worried that factions in the Soviet Union might go rogue, so in the year 1960 we shared third-party verification with the Soviet Empire. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, the military wanted to have a first strike on the Soviets, but Kennedy refused. After the crisis was over, the military told Kennedy, you just lost our last chance to defeat the Russians. Kennedy was sure the hawks in the military would have gone nuclear if they had all their codes. That same decade, forces in the KGB want to instigate 
instigate a nuclear war between China and the United States. In the year 1968, the KGB loaded 11 extra men onto the sub K-129 and sent them early on their patrol. The sub K-29 broke radio contact and went silent. Evidence shows the 11 extra men took control of K-129 sub and took it within 300 miles of Pearl Harbor like a Chinese sub would. Then they launched a nuclear missile at Pearl Harbor. Not having the three-party code, the missile self-destructed, taking the K-129 down three miles to the ocean bottom. The plan was ill-informed. We were monitoring all the Soviet subs, and we would have known if it was them. This would have started World War III. Not you, me, or the world would be here if it wasn't for Eisenhower sharing the three-party code technology with the Soviets and Russian submariners who did not give the code to their captors. It is assumed Putin doesn't have all three codes and can't launch or use any of his own nukes. That's why Putin is building more when he has tens of thousands of nuclear weapons. Folks, this is probably a good time for me to state that uh, we are not fact-checking your comments. We're just sharing them because they sound interesting. So don't take any of this as like 100% fact. If it's interesting to you, do some research and find some good verified sources. I'm not saying that this story is true or is not true, it's just early enough in the video where I feel I should point that out. Story 3. The Nth Country Experiment. In 1964, the CIA hired three students who had just gotten their PhDs in physics without any prior experience in nuclear weapons, and asked them to design a nuclear device with a military significant yield using only unclassified information. It took them two and a half years. Note that they didn't develop a nuclear bomb, they only designed it. They concluded that designing such a weapon wouldn't be the difficult part, but rather obtaining the materials necessary, namely enriched uranium. Too long didn't read, this experiment concluded that if you manage to get enriched uranium, which from time to time show up in the black market, anyone could theoretically make a nuclear bomb. So if three fresh PhDs managed to design a nuclear weapon with minimal funding in the 1960s, just imagine what a group like ISIS or a country with a maniac in power couldn't do with proper funding in the 21st century. Intelligence agencies just need to fail one time so that those people can get their hands on what they need to change the world as we know it. Story 4. My father was also in the army and he had told me about a project that they were working on and my dad was always a straight shooter. My dad never told stories, my dad fares on, so it was never a liar when he told you something. He meant and said to the US government was working on some training exercises, is what they call it to prepare for an alien arrival, but here's the funny weird part of it, like the catch is that the aliens were humans, so basically the government was planning on attacking someone fit and say who, pretending that they were UFOs and aliens, while they were attacking these people leaving and then helping defend the world against aliens was basically like that Ronald Reagan speech about how insignificant we would be if aliens were to attack the planet. My dad swore up and down that that was true, that the US government had plans to attack even its own people with made-up UFOs that looked real, that the human looked like they were actually aliens. They were literally going to kill people to make it seem like aliens have attacked planet Earth in the hopes of bringing people together, controlling people. I don't know, but that was another one. You know, we have now recently had a government thing where there was someone claiming that, you know, ooh, non-Earth, biologic, whatever, aliens exist, and everyone's talking about it, even though uh, I, you know, I'm sure aliens are out there. The government having aliens, I don't know about that. But maybe they're bringing it up just to cover up attacks, like this story said. It's all lining up, folks. They're going to convince you that aliens are real, and then they're going to alien us for some reason. Story 5. Just to add another note, Unit 731 didn't experiment on our POWs, but what's equally horrifying is that they experimented on Chinese peasants. The details I've read are horrific for all involved, but what's worse is that they get their hands on the data we basically made deals with the Japanese government and the administrator of that unit. Even more horrific, by and large, in my opinion, the data was useless. There was nothing learned there that couldn't have been extrapolated by common sense or found out by more sensible experiments. 
evil idiocy hidden by bureaucracy. For example, you really couldn't guess what was going to happen to a guy submerged in freezing water and then put into a tank of hot water and such forth. You needed to tie Chinese peasants to a post marked 5, 10, 15, 20 feet away and then detonate a bomb at ground zero to catch the blast radius? No, it was just cruelty hidden behind scientific curiosity. A kid with a magnifying glass and ants taken to the ultimate extreme. Story 6. I learned about the Challenger Zero rings in a business studies, usually in a communications-related subject. I learned it as groupthink, where the entire group gets together to pressure the odd person out to agree with them and go forward with the wrong decision. Though for Challenger, it was one of the managers that pushed them to go ahead as it would make them look bad to the media because they had delayed the launch a number of times already. And we all know not looking bad is the right choice. Clearly. Just remember that for anyone going through officer recruitment for military, they will ask you to choose between options and you should always pick what the media would pick, the popular choice. Not the best choice for the issue, the choice that makes people feel good about themselves, even if the best choice saves lives. Remember that. They want group thinkers. Boy, you don't like to hear about stuff like this, like, especially if you're, you know, trying to get into a spaceship to go to space and there are problems. And the fact that there's someone who can be like, no, nah, no, nah, we've already delayed a few times. The media is getting antsy. Just launch them up there. Space travel doesn't have to be, you know, that precise, does it? And all the mathematicians and physicists and stuff and engineers are just tearing their hair out, screaming in frustration. Babysitters, what's the darkest family secret you know? Viewer edition. Hey folks, quick content warning for this video. Sadly, there is going to be some mention of child abuse of varying degrees. And so if you are sensitive to that subject matter, you might want to brace yourself or you may even want to skip this video. Story 1. I had one client starting when I was 13. She had been a very young first-time mother and had six children by the time I began working for her. I loved that she had so many books to read, that her kids were nice, her house was cozy, she was very nice, and the children she babysat during the day were sweet too. Yes, I used to babysit for as many as 12 to 15 children at a time, sometimes for very long hours on the weekends. It was great. I made a lot of money, and even her enormous dogs were nice. Sadly, her husband was away on an extended military assignment, but she had a lot of friends in similar situations, so she had fun. And I didn't even mind spending the whole weekend there occasionally, as then I really made money. She also recommended me to some of her friends. Did I mention she was a great cook and would leave delicious food for the children and I? I was very young and very naive, so when a man brought her home one night, I woke up 2 a.m. or so, me snoozing on the comfy couch with nice bedding she made up for me. I greeted him by what she had told me was her husband's name, figuring that she had probably picked him up from work so they could go out. Oops. She introduced me to him, and it was not her husband. It was just a friend. She wrote me a really generous check and then told her friend to pay me and he gave me a wad of money. Woohoo! And I got driven home. I think that was the best babysitting gig ever. Thank you, Mrs. F. Okay, I think uh, most of us watching this uh, might have some idea as to who this friend was. And, uh, you know, not for us to judge. We don't know the situation, what everyone's going through, anything like that. You made your money, a nice little bonus in there, and you kept your nose out of other people's business, however sordid it may be. Story 2. Not a babysitting story, but this girl I was friends with had a single mom that bought alcohol for us and partied with us all the time. We were 15 to 17. As a kid, I thought this was cool. My husband and I grew up together, so he was often there as well. He randomly started calling her mom a pedo, not behind her back, but to her face. I thought he was joking with her or something until he told me that she had offered him a ride home one night and instead of taking him home, she pulled into an empty church parking lot in the middle of nowhere. He was 16, she was like 46. She leaned over and put her hand on his D and shoved her tongue down his throat. Him and I were together at this time as well. He pushed her away and said he wasn't interested and it was weird. She told him she was disappointed and if he ever changed his mind, he knew where to find her. She then took him home. He was so embarrassed he didn't tell anyone for months until he told me, and he tried to act normal, going over there so no one would get suspicious. 
He ended up telling me because she had started randomly touching him and he wasn't comfortable hanging out there anymore. He asked me not to tell anyone. I never did and obviously understood why he was uncomfortable. When we stopped going over there, her mom told her that it was probably because Alicia found out he cheated with me. I crap you not. She told her daughter they kissed when she said something to me about it. I asked him if I could tell her the truth due to the situation and he reluctantly said yes. I told her. She was disgusted at first and said she totally understood why we weren't hanging out at her house anymore. A little while later, the whole vibe between us changed and we slowly stopped being friends. <sighs> hey folks, if this happens to you, be you a guy, girl, non-binary, whatever, uh, even if this is a woman doing this because there's still some people with this mindset, so let me just tell you now, that is still S assault. That is not okay in the least. And you are perfectly, A, it says nothing bad about you, and B, you should tell someone that you trust, because that just should not be allowed to happen. And you should not have to, like, hang on to that like some secret. It's nothing to be embarrassed about. Screw people who do that kind of stuff and tell someone you trust. It is okay. Story three. It's so petty stuff that babysitters see. A thing all girls said in high school was they wouldn't pay you until next time because they wanted to make sure you came back next week. What they did was get drunk every weekend. They would come back wasted and just say you could go, they pay you later. The truth was they drank himself broke. They didn't have the money until next week. One of my friends said she babysat for the neighbors and they stayed in bed until three in the afternoon. The kids were on their own. When they wanted her to babysit the next week, they said they would pay Saturday. They went out Saturday and Friday, and they owed her last week. She said, no. So they paid her for last week and Friday. They came back at 2 in the morning and said they would find another babysitter. That Saturday, they were begging her to watch their kids. They ran out of the house before they paid her and refused to pay her for that night. Often there was no food in the house, so she used her money to buy food for the kids. They were late on paying her and just left the kids alone. They came over, begged her to watch them. You're saying, call social services? Yeah, right. As bad as that is, getting the system involved is worse. All the girls I knew said more or less the same thing. Parents went out drinking and came home drunk. They all hated paying the babysitter and there was hardly food in the house. The kids were needy and unhappy. Not a single parent was poor or low-lifers. Going out to drink shouldn't be seen as normal. Story 4 when I was in kindergarten, I was not yet diagnosed with autism yet and was a standout to my fellow classmates. My teacher, let's call her Ms. Poor, would mark me down on a behavior chart, the ones where if you were good and got marked up, vice versa if you were bad, and would do this every day until I transitioned to first grade. She would also pinch me for every infraction that was in her mind not good. This ranged from laughing at all, getting marked down, accidentally messing up drawings, reading anything on the Titanic, was a huge enthusiast, or disrespecting her. Because she marked me down so much, she got the full permission from admin to keep me inside during recess and make me walk laps around a massive field. I was yelled at by her in front of the class, and she would berate me every time I was forced to stay in during recess. One time I shook my head while she berated me and she grabbed me, and in front of my face she started yelling so much I think the kids outside could hear her. Even my friends weren't safe as she would do everything in her power to keep them down as well as myself. That was back in 2014 and I will never forgive her. Story 5. So, this is a story about my friend. She lives in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, so her father is a landlord as well. One of the people renting an apartment from her father asked for a last-minute babysitter, so he volunteered his daughter, my friend, to babysit her son, who was seven years old at the time. So it gets interesting. The mom and dad told my friend they would be home around maybe 10 p.m. or later than that, so, you know, her and the kid were hanging out. The next thing she knows, the kid just says they're not going to be home until later than that. My friend literally says, how do you know this? Then the kid says, my parents usually do this type of thing often. And damn, the kid was right. His parents came back home around maybe three in the morning. My friend was sleeping in the living room when they came in drunk as bloody skunks and just say they tipped my friend pretty well that night, enough that will cover her con badge and some stuff at the con that summer. Found out later at that convention from my friend that the parents were at a college house party with a friend who was an alumni of one of the students. 
Long story short, it was a wild party. The things I hear from my friends whose parents are landlords, I swear. And as for that kid, I hope he's doing well. I mean, I'm not a parent, but I can see why they might end up staying out a little bit too late. You're stuck home with a kid, especially at seven. It's kind of at the age where you've just really, truly began to start going out and staying out and having fun, you know. You've had years of dedicating your every bit of free time to a child. And so you might party a little bit too hard, and I get that, but be up front with your babysitters and stuff. Parents, don't tell them like, oh yeah, we'll be home by like 11 or 12, and then stumble in at 3. Like, you know, just be completely up front. Let them know, hey, however long you're here, we're going to pay you, stuff like that. Is that okay? Like, don't lie to people just so you can go out and have fun. Be on the same page. Story 6. I had my teacher call CPS on my family once when I was in third grade. I have a fairly large birthmark on my stomach that I'm very self-conscious about. One day I was stretching or something and another kid saw it and asked what it was. Being self-conscious about my body in general, I didn't want the kids to have something else to make fun of me for, so I made up something that would sound cool. Having played a lot of video games, specifically Doom and other shooters, my stupid third grade brain decided the best course of action was to say, I was shot, and leave it at that. It worked. They didn't make fun of me. The next day, I'm pulled into the counselor's office with three teachers and somebody in a suit I had never seen before. Retrospectively, this was probably a CPS agent. They asked me about it, and because I wasn't trying to impress the teachers or stop them from bullying me like I was my classmates, I told them the truth and showed them the birthmark. Never heard about it again, and I don't think they ever spoke to my mother. Story 7 this goes to show that the people that we think are perfect aren't, and that things are not what they seem. Nobody is perfect. There are skeletons in everyone's closet. That person who you think had such a great life might be dealing with hidden struggles that you know nothing of. Ask before you go assuming stuff about anything. That's why we should not compare ourselves to other people in a negative way. Everyone's life is different, and everyone has different things that they are able and aren't able to do. And I'm all for a good competition, but if you feel bad about yourself because you're not as perfect as the image that people on social media put out, you're going to constantly feel unfulfilled and bad about yourself because there will always be someone better than you, so work on beating your records and not other people's records, because other people's records might not be possible for you. These are the most hurtful things a girl has ever said to a man, viewer edition. Story 1. My first had a three-year-old daughter, so I was not only starting my first ever serious relationship, but also taking on parenthood. Turns out I was actually pretty good at it, and I loved them both like the moon and the stars. We've been living together for several months when she started acting combative all the time and coming up with bizarre explanations for suspicious things around the house. Finally, she pushed us apart by looking for any reason to fight, and we decided to take some time apart. On that Valentine's Day, I packed my crap and she invited over her new boyfriend, sat on his lap, and watched me move out. Later on, she told me that all the fighting was her way of making me want to leave. Found out about her pregnancy through a friend not long after that. Turned out she'd gotten herself pregnant with a co-worker while we were living together. So I lost my first girlfriend and my surrogate daughter all in one go. I took it really hard, starved myself, and went from 170 pounds down to 125 and almost killed myself by playing chicken with a semi, passing a car with no room to make it. I won, but mind you, I'm not proud of that. It's like those dark days all happened in a fever dream. Never wanted death so badly in all my years. I didn't date for nine years after that. Two decades later, we got back in touch on Facebook, and almost right away she tried to get us back together while being another man's fiancé. She even sent me nude pictures and claimed her daughter missed me and was excited to reunite with me. Turns out her daughter, that sweet little kid I loved with all my heart back then, had been twisted into something dark and bitter by repeated molestation from her mom's terrible boyfriend choices over the years since we broke up. The daughter not only didn't want to reunite with me, she wrote me one of the nastiest messages I've ever received, calling me a loser, evil, a manipulator, a homewrecker, and just another piece of crap her mother dragged in from the gutter. So I kind of lost my little girl twice. 
First time, she was torn from me. Second time, I found out she was gone. Just gone. Replaced by some malignant creature created by that horribly reckless mother of hers. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you all that women are evil. And I won't even necessarily tell you that she is evil. But at the end of the day, when a person is so recklessly dangerous that they wreck your life, their daughter's life, their own life, over and over, and never even learn from it... Evil doesn't matter. An unseen hole in the ground that opens up into a cave chamber is an evil, but take one step too close, and if you don't die on impact way down there in the dark, you're likely to wish you had. The tough trick of it is to recognize that hungry abyss before it eats you alive. Yeah, I agree that I wouldn't necessarily call any of these people evil. They might be going through their own traumas, and you want to feel bad for them. But also, she's causing hurt in your life and her daughter's life. And she has some responsibility to that, and you're not at all required to forgive that. And I am very, very sorry for whatever you have gone through or anyone watching this who's gone through something similar. I will always tell people that Things can absolutely get better. You can absolutely find someone who act really genuinely appreciates you, who's, you know, going to be a better person and is at a better place in their life. It's not always easy. Sometimes these things are just awful and they suck. And I don't think anything I say will 100% make that better. It just takes time and loved ones that you can trust, and they do exist. Story two. Mine was years ago. Back when I was in sixth grade, I accidentally forgot to bring materials for a project. The small, embarrassed me quietly asked for my mates, but they don't have any extra. Around this time, my teacher is going around the room checking on how everyone is doing. Seeing that I didn't have anything done, she took him to the middle of the room and helped me. Saying it this way made it sound kind, but the experience was brutal. So upon bringing me to the middle of the room, there was some sort of mini stage there, by the way, so that the teacher would be seen by those that sat at the back. She suddenly started to say nasty things unto me. It caught me off guard. She said things like, you're so useless. You may be smart, but you lack common sense. What will you do if time comes? You're nothing without your grades. Not to brag, but I was top of the class, by the way, and for me, my identity is formed around being the smart and social guy that you can depend on. After she said this, I just teared up. Seeing that I teared up, she added more salt to the wound by laughing and joking around, encouraging those in my class to laugh as well. At that moment, I was devastated. I didn't know what she, didn't know that she was this brutal. I bawled while everyone in class laughed so much. After that incident, I cried even up till the way home. It also caused my emotional health into a downward spiral, to the point that I was depressed and was just ready to die. It hurts, it was a long time ago, but it still scarred me. From the social kid that I am, I started to close myself off. Even now, I still have social anxiety. I just can't bring back the old social and jolly me anymore. First off, what she said was wrong and cruel, and that's being a bad teacher. And hopefully she has learned from that and isn't repeating that mistake with other students who also do not deserve that. Forgetting something, no, that is not her place. And But I do know that that stuff can stick with you. It shouldn't, but it is hard to shake those words, especially in formative years. All I'll say for folks, if you're dealing with that stuff, Therapy can really help. Having an unbiased third party that can walk you through that stuff and understand it can really help you get over those hurdles. So if that is an option, I would recommend it. Um, and if not, finding trusted friends and family members that you can open up to and talk to about that stuff could also help. But just know, people that say crap like this suck and... You shouldn't listen to their opinions. It's kind of like if you if you just knew someone that you absolutely didn't like and they had an opinion on like a movie you liked that you disagreed with, why would you listen to them? Sucks to them. Their opinion shouldn't matter. Story 3 Recently, I met a girl when I moved into college. I got pretty close with her, and because we had a good back-and-forth thing going where we'd take turns inviting each other to do stuff, I hoped it would escalate to a friendship. As of the time of me writing this about a month ago, she got COVID. I messaged her throughout her quarantine just to try and keep her company, but eventually she fell silent. I assumed it was because she had a lot of work to do, but the silence eventually became deafening and my head started to spin about if I did anything wrong. She wouldn't explain, and later on a friend told me that she said that I made her uncomfortable and she doesn't want to hear from me. I feel like if she valued my company like I valued hers, she'd tell me what I did wrong so I can apologize. 
Part of me wants to move on, but part of me also wants to ask her personally what I did wrong so I can learn from my mistake and hopefully be friends again, but I'm probably being overly optimistic. Still emotionally recovering from this. Story 4. Well, that's a long story. It was a Valentine's Day in school, and there was a girl I loved. I, however, genuinely considered myself out of her league, but I still wrote a poem and dropped it in an anonymous mailbox. Several days in, we have P.E. and some a-hole threw my bag in the girl's dressing room. I ask one girl to retrieve the bag. She agrees, but then returns without a bag and says that she wasn't allowed to do it and I should get inside and take the bag myself. Dying a little inside, I walk in, get pulled deeper, door blocked behind me, and there she stands along with her orbiters, paper heart in her hands, and a mix of grin and disgust on her face. She reads the poem mockingly, tearing it down line by line, then gives me long, the reason why you suck and should off yourself monologue while everyone else giggles. And then they force me to kiss one shy girl, threatening to tell everyone about me being a pervert invading dressing rooms. Then they did it anyway. Or rumors broke out, I don't know. Results, however, is a lot of fingers pointing and evasion. Much, much later, it's a school graduation party. I wouldn't even go, but was peer pressured into it. I'm tipsy. She approaches me and says that she did have some feelings for me, but with me being low in school hierarchy, she felt it to be a bad idea. One of her orbiters recognized the handwriting in the poem and wouldn't shut up about it. So, to save her reputation and cut rumors short, she came up with all of it. And this broke me. I wasn't the hated person. I wasn't a rejected person. I wasn't even a person. I was merely a potential reputation stain being chewed through and through because I might have earned her some weird looks and words behind back. Story 5. A similar thing happened to me when I was in a bar. I'm not a good-looking guy. So, I'm in a bad mood, and I'm just sitting there for the drinks when this hot girl walks up to me and asks me if I could let her kiss me. Not being in a good mood that day, I turned my gaze to her booth where her friends playing Truth and Dare are eagerly looking our direction. Consequently, I ask her if she had been dared by her friends to kiss me, to which she replies back, Yes, but it shouldn't matter to guys like you anyway. Any guy in my place would have swallowed his self-esteem and let her in, but I was quick to turn her down, and as expected, pretty girls aren't used to hearing no. So she leans over to kiss my face when I push her away. She's flabbergasted, not realizing what just happened to her. Meanwhile, her friends seated in their booth are shocked with their mouths open in disbelief. She's disgraced and couldn't bear to look at me anymore. She stomps away to her booth without saying another word. Half the people in the bar couldn't believe what they'd just witnessed. I didn't feel sorry for her as I had greater sorrows to drown myself in. I stayed at the bar for another hour with people whispering to each other and glancing at me continuously from where they were seated. I could hear her sob from humiliation. I left that bar when I drunk enough. Not once have I ever felt regret for my actions that night. All right, first off, the thing that she was trying to do, forcing herself upon you, is assault. So that's not okay, and you have every right to be upset with that. Uh, B, don't call yourself not good looking or whatever, you know, like everyone can be, you know, their confidence, the way you dress, the way you purport yourself. I know it, it's something that takes um, conscious effort and everything like that, but I promise there are people out there who would love how basically anyone looks. Um, and I know there are some people that are naturally gifted or well, gifted, whatever you want to call it, that have very traditional good looks. But I just don't weigh yourself against those things too heavily. You know, you're allowed to be happy and, you know, look how you look. And there are people out there who appreciate that. I don't know. What's your biggest I have to get out of here as soon as possible moments? Viewer edition. Story one. On a little vacation to a magic town, that's what we call old pueblos turned tourist hotspots in Mexico, after having dinner with friends, my aunt and her husband decided to go to the friend's shop to do a little perusing. I was tired, so I decided to walk back to the inn. It was not far away, there were lots of people out and about, and that town was famous for being a pretty safe place. At least, certainly much safer than the city I grew up in. That's pretty much the reason why I let my guard down so much that night. 
I was just walking when I heard a guy say to another man behind me, good night, and the other man answered, good night back at him. When he passed me, he said, good night to me as well, and of friggin' course, I answered, good night. Immediately, he took it as an invitation to get in my way, try to chat me up, and to friggin' touch me in any way he could. A-hole kept grabbing my, fr my braid. As soon as I get over the confusion, I'm like, hey, you know what? I forgot something back at the shop. Just gonna go get it. Then I turned around and speed walked away as fast as I could. Dude kept following me and asking questions like, where are you staying? I gave him the name of an inn in the same direction I was going, but far away enough from the one I was actually staying at. Or, do you have a boyfriend? Yes, I lied. He's not here right now because he's a soldier. He also kept trying to lure me into dark alleys. Hey, my aunt shop is over there, wanna come? I just ignored him and kept walking. Finally, I made it to the shop and get in. I immediately tell my aunt's husband, Venezuelan, Venezuelan 1.8 meter tall dude, what happened, and he goes to confront the a-hole. Dude literally just turned around and fled as soon as he saw uncle step out of the building. So the thing is, folks, even in some safe areas, there can still be awful people who are going to try and find ways to take advantage of you. So be like this person, be alert, don't fall for their stuff, don't get alone with them, and get to somewhere safe as fast as you can. Even if, by chance, they are just a nice person who's just coming off as creepy, you're way better safe than sorry. Story 2. I went to art school for illustration with a guy who would be classified as extremely Russian. His name was Gene. He always sat in the back of the classroom reading a newspaper written entirely in Cyrillic, I have no idea where the hell he got him from, and was perpetually drunk on vodka and he drank that he drank like water. On the first evening of a night class we had together, the professor grabbed Gene's water bottle within a few minutes of talking to him, opened it, smelled it, and then blurted, Is this a screwdriver? To which Gene just grinned. Later that same class, after Gene had made a rather ridiculous joke, the professor asked the rest of us, Is he always like this? To which we answered, Yes, it's Gene. His natural state is drunk. Partway through sophomore year, Gene earned his citizenship. His oath of citizenship ceremony was during another class we had together, and a couple of his buddies had gone to the ceremony with him to take pictures of for him. He made it back before class ended, came bursting through the door wrapped in an American flag with a stars and stripes baseball cap on, crowing, I am an American now! I love this country! I'm never going back! in a stereotypically thick Russian accent. He was one of the nicest guys I've ever met. Incredibly talented illustrator, too. LOL. Well, you just totally strung us along for a scenario that ended with, and it turns out he was a really nice guy. You didn't have to get away from anything. He was, as anybody is, an individual, and perfectly capable of being very nice, if maybe not with a little bit of a drinking problem. Story 3. Was at a punk rock hardcore show in Charlotte years ago to see a popular local band. After the opening bands were done and the band I came to see was setting up, about 50 skinheads walked in. FYI, I had recently started shaving my head because I was going bald, not for any political statement. I'm not gonna lie, I was getting very nervous already. Over the next few minutes, several of the skins had introduced themselves to me and were asking questions about my heritage and political beliefs. I answered as vaguely as possible each time, then one of the biggest in the group starts making his way to me. Before he gets to me, several of his crew stops him, and they are all talking, looking over at me occasionally, nodding and smiling. My spidey sense was on full effing alert. When they weren't looking, I slipped out the door and effing ran to my car and went all the way home without passing go. Found out a few weeks later that they were in town recruiting for new members. I still shudder to think about what could have happened if I had stayed long enough for the big bastard to make his way over to me. I know it would not have ended well for me. Story 4 For me, it was definitely the time I was driving out to deliver some floating docks to a customer in a pretty wooded and remote area. Customer had given me some written directions because GPS directions wouldn't bring me the correct way to get to their property. I had gotten maybe 30 minutes into the woods on pavement, then it transitioned to gravel and dirt for maybe another 20 or so. 
several forks in the road, and I just kept on as per directions, and then following the correct path became difficult as it curved a bun. I then went down some switchbacks, which wasn't described to me, but no place to turn around with a large pickup and trailer. It was when I reached the bottom of this area that I realized I had to leave. It went from thick woods to a campground-looking area with parked trailer homes, shipping containers, and roughly built shacks. I was driving pretty slow to try and find a good place to turn around in. I spotted a bunch of children that saw me and darted away to the various buildings, and then adults stepped out. None were armed, but they had deep-seated hatred in their eyes. One man pointed at me and hollered something. I simply gave a polite wave and began to back into a space I felt was large enough to turn around in. A vehicle appeared not too far away with several men in it, and we headed to the start of the switchbacks. I tossed caution to the wind and drove like a bat out of hell. I was followed for a short time, then either lost them or they felt I wouldn't return and let me be. Mind you, I'm 19 at this time, and this would have been my second time driving this truck with a trailer. I didn't lose any material, but the trailer did pop off the hitch, and I was dragging it by the chains for who knows how long. Fun times. Story 5. So this story happened when I was like 14. It was night, and I was taking out the trash. As I approached the trash can, a car slowed down and stopped by my house. Nobody got out. I got nervous and speed walked the rest of the way to the trash can. When I put the trash in, I got a gut feeling that told me to get back inside as soon as possible and that I was in danger. So I ran inside as fast as I could. I wanted to see if I was just being dumb and paranoid. After all, I lived in an average neighborhood. Nothing exciting goes on there. So as soon as I got inside and locked the door, I looked through the large window next to the door. I watched the car leave. The car came while I was outside, and it had only stayed until I got inside, then it left. The car left right after I got inside where I was safe. That was the moment I realized I almost got kidnapped. If I had taken my time while taking out the trash that night, I seriously could have been abducted. I think that's the most life-threatening thing that's ever happened to me. Moral of the story? Listen to your gut. Even if you feel like you're just being paranoid, your gut may be right. Goodness knows what would have happened to me if I had brushed it off as a coincidence that a car parked in front of my house while I was taking out the trash at night. Folks, a lot of things like kidnappings and stuff like that happen in perfectly nice neighborhoods or safe neighborhoods, you know. They happen there because people think that they are safe and they let their guard down, unfortunately. That's not to say that your safe neighborhood is suddenly something that should be terrifying to you. It just says that you should always be on at least somewhat high alert, you know, or some amount of alertness. And if you've got a bad gut feeling about something, just trust it. Story 6. Well, I was sitting at a restaurant with my cousins, three younger and the same age as me. We saw two men come inside, not in a positive mood, I would say, tell something to the cashier, and I understand they were looking for a woman, voices getting louder. Now everybody was looking at the scene. I made a hand gesture to, we are leaving as soon as possible. At first, my younger cousins didn't want to leave. They got excited about the scene. And the same age cousin kind of hesitated to stay or go. I tell you, I'm a very silent person, not very talkative. We are leaving now, said very silently. Cousins understand I was too serious. We left, looked calmly, but fast as we could. Little cousins made comments about I was running, don't do action, and were too cowardly to do anything. While we are walking, police cars pass by. We hear screams. After that, no one commented about me leaving the scene. No, we are not in a movie. No one's going to save us in heroic ways. You may get shot. Everyone would think about themselves if running was an option. So don't get excited about risky things, I said after shock passed my cousins. Story 7. Once, I was hanging out at my friend's backyard who had a pit bull I was on bad terms with. They always kept it inside and I kept having a gut feeling to leave, but didn't listen because I thought it was fake. Sometimes fear interjects and tells the brain it's a gut feeling when it's not. You can learn which is and isn't after a while. This was not one of those times. Anyways, after a while, their sister-in-law, I think, went outside, and the pit bull got out, and I was blocking it with my bike. 
Then it ran and attacked me, but failed, thankfully, because I had a backpack on and my bike protecting my front. And it was biting and yanking at my bag for about 30 seconds until the father who was out there the entire time pulled the dog from its collar away from me and very, very quickly biked home without saying goodbye. Haven't hung out with them since. I will say, as the owner of a uh, Pitbull Sharpe mix, who very much looks like a Pitbull and everything, it's all in how dogs are trained. This is on the owners of that dog, because uh, my little pity, she is the sweetest, most lovable dog I've ever known. And I've met a number of other people who have had, like, purebred pit bulls and stuff like that, who were the sweetest animals you've ever met. And so those uh, friends of yours that you're not talking to, they need to take better care of that animal and maybe invest in a little bit of training because something's gone wrong somewhere. Maybe they adopted it or it was a rescue that had already had bad training, which can be tough to deal with, but still, no blame on, blame on the dog. I'm putting the blame on the folks here, unfortunately. What secret you won't share with anyone in person? Viewer edition. Hey folks, quick content warning at the top of the video. A number of these stories are going to contain things of a intimate nature, be it harassment, assault, or just general content. I don't think any of it is too terribly bad, so if you're uncomfortable with it, you might just want to be, you know, prepared to know it's coming, or you may end up wanting to skip this video. Story 1. Using a throwaway email account that I usually use for, as the username says, baiting scammers, so that no one will ever stumble upon this, or at least so that the person in question never finds this because that would be embarrassing for me. Too long didn't read, accidentally saw my best friend's breast through her top as she was changing clothes during a dance clip project she organized that I helped her film. I will never tell anyone in person, especially her unless I have literally no choice because we don't lie to each other. Context. I'm male, so my best friend, female, who organized our school's dance club, had a video clip project for the dance club planned to be filmed during the start of the summer holidays. About two months before the clip was to be filmed, their cameraman was no longer available to film, so there was a bit of panic for finding someone who had the skills to film, wanted to slash didn't mind, and was available for all the filming dates. She told me this, and someone who took the school's cinema course was like, if you don't find anyone by mid-June, tell me I can work a camera reasonably well, so I basically became the new cameraman. Skip to during the filming, once I get there and am checking out the phone that was to be used for filming, I knew it was a good phone for using, but I had never used it, so was finding all the settings and doing quick tests. Whenever my friend comes over and is like, by the way, just so you know, there's a lot of costume changes, so make sure to turn away if seeing some of us in underwear bothers you. Already you know where this is going. The first thing I thought was, nobody planned to bring something like a beach tent? The second thought was, crap, I could potentially accidentally see my best friend in underwear. That could be awkward for me. Here's the problem. I had a crush on her. She knew. I had told her a few months before the whole filming project happened, so she was well aware of what she just caused in my head. The reason I thought it could be awkward for me, and not just in general, is because she's a person who doesn't have a lot of care about these things, as in she would just shrug it off after and be like, whoops, but if you were in the middle of a conversation, would finish the conversation before going whoops. So after processing quickly what she just told me, and probably immediately turning red, just responded with, okay. She did something crossed between a laugh and a snicker. She knew what she did, and trust me, she mentions it every now and then just to see my embarrassed look, but she doesn't know the full reason why. Side note, when I say best friend, I mean the most important person to me that is not family, but may as well be family type of best friend. We were inseparable and are now only separable due to me being at uni, but whatever. We can... We can, we don't find the time to meet up, we make the time. So skip to the last day of filming, and by that point, I had had a whoops moment with practically the entire dance group. There were 13 of them in the group, so had at least one whoops moment with 9 or 10 out of the 13, but miraculously avoided one with her. FYI, the entire dance group nearly were quite similar to my best friend when it came to whoops moments due to the group being mixed, so it didn't even occur to them that for someone that only officially arrived in their group like two weeks prior, it could be a bit awkward. But that luck was about to run out on me 20 minutes before we wrapped up filming. 
So we were just talking as she was rummaging through the multiple bags filled with clothes. Don't even remember what we were talking about. Nothing important anyway. So it's prob so it prob so it problem concerned the final scene for the clip because I know that I had the camera in my hand and I was adjusting a couple settings on it because of the lighting from the sun that was going to blind the camera otherwise. When she asked me to pass her the water bottle that was in the cool bag next to me, at that point she was still in clothes that she was wearing during the previous scene. So I just grabbed the bottle from the bag. While I'm in the cool bag, she complains that she is going to have to wear an extra layer of clothing under the next outfit. I ask why, and she answers because the outfit for the next scene has no sleeves and is fairly open on the back and that her bra was black and the outfit was pure white. But the outfit was rather loose at the front, so she had to wear something or her breasts could slip out, so she has to wear something under the outfit. But also, that it has to be a tight fit, and that with the heat, it must have been 40 degrees Celsius in the sun, which we were, it was going to cook her. I responded with, oh. <clears throat> So after fiddling with the cool bag, which was being a pain to close, I get up to give her the bottle of water she asked for, and when I turned around, I noticed that she had changed her top. So far, all is good, but I had to go around the pile of bags, and when I got round it, since I was at a different angle, the way the light was hitting the top made the top rather see-through on one side. As I noticed that, I also noticed that underneath that rather see-through top, she had nothing else on, and by see-through, I mean that during the two seconds that this took place, I could quite clearly make out her entire right breast to the point that she had a tattoo. Then, then I would have been able to clearly make it out, even if it was only a centimeter big. So I did what any person in my situation would do, which was to quickly give her the bottle and turn around as fast as possible without making it obvious that I saw anything. Because in my head, a whoops moment where I see her just in underwear is one thing, but this was something completely different that could be embarrassing even for her. Which, now looking back on the moment with the knowledge of the conversation that we've had since then, and we've had some weird conversations to say the least, and completely sober might I add because she doesn't really drink, it's highly, un it's highly likely that she would have shrugged it off since, one, we're best friends and all friendships have their funny, weird, embarrassing moments, this would be ours, and two, I turned away as soon as I could after giving her the water because she was dying from the heat. I am so hell bent on keeping this a secret, especially from her, that while playing truth or dare with her, where the questions asked if someone could choose truth could be as not safe for work as we wanted, that I prefer to admit to having watched furry videos on 18 plus sites over revealing this secret to her when I was asked, what's something that nobody knows and that you would prefer to take to the grave? I can already hear people thinking, but you could just make something up. Nope. One, it's truth or dare. You agree to never lie no matter how embarrassing the answer is. Two, I hate lying and have never lied to her about anything and never will. I won't bring something like this up for no reason, but if for X reason she asked me something like, hey, remember when we filmed that dance project, specifically the last scene we filmed where I wore all the white top outfit was the top I had to wear under its see-through at all, I would tell her the full truth, but unless she brings it up or brings something up where I would have to tell her, then I won't. And three, we know each other is, we know when each other is lying. Now that contradicts what I just said about never lying to her, but I'm not counting the I'm fine lie when actually feeling like crying my soul out. That's a lie that we both extremely good at pulling on the other world, yet we both see right through each other each time. Like it's scary how good we are at seeing through each other's lie to the point where even by text we can read I'm fine and know that something's wrong. All right, I'm going to say a few things. First off, I thought this was going to be way worse from the start of that story, and it's not. It's honestly kind of nothing. You did the right thing by turning away. Like, yeah, you looked for like two seconds because your brain's processing like, wait, what? Uh, no, I'm not supposed to. Huh. Like, I think you did the right thing, and I think it's fine. You saw it through a sheer shirt. Yeah, okay, it's a breast. And you think your friend would be fine with it, so I think that you should tell her. And I think that you're saying, oh, you won't lie to her. There's a thing called lying by omission. If you're keeping this secret from her, it's probably kind of festering, enough so that you wrote a very long post about it. And I think that it weighs on you, and if you keep keeping this from her, lying by omission, then I think it might kind of affect you in the future. I think you're better off to just say, hey, I just want to get this off my chest, let her know, and chances are, with how good of friends you sound to be, I think she's going to be understanding. I think she's going to be fine. I think she'll be a little, 
you know, confused as to why you kept this from her for so long, but yeah, believe me, I... I think everything's okay. I don't think you did anything really wrong, uh, aside from just... I don't even necessarily think it's wrong keeping it from her and worrying about it, but I don't think it's doing you any favors. Story 2. My little secret is that I basically have a full-length adult novel in my head most days, and it's very, very racy. Lots and lots of, lots and lots of uh, going on in my imagination, which may be weird because I'm a woman. I don't know if other women think like this, but I do. I'm fairly hyper-intimate anyways, and sometimes I get myself so worked up thinking about it that by the time my husband gets home, I'm a horny friggin' disaster and he gets torn apart as soon as he gets in the door. And I'm very orally fixated. I think that I like that and get off on it more than he does sometimes. Not that he minds either, lol. I like giving more than receiving. It's so important to me that I can't even get in the mood without that being the first thing that happens. And I can say all of this because I'm under an assumed name and no one knows who I am. I may become unalived if anyone ever does find out out of sheer embarrassment. I've been a voiceover artist for many years and I got my start doing audiobooks. And a lot of the audiobooks that I've narrated um, are erotica. No joke. Uh, some male male, some male female, you know. I'm all over the place. Um, but I will also say this. The vast majority of authors that I've worked for, and certainly the ones that were the most lewd, all women. I don't think there's anything unusual about you being a woman and being that way. Like, I've known plenty of women in my life who were much more intimate and interested in that stuff than even I am. So, uh, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that for you or anybody else watching who might be having those thoughts. What was banned at your school? And why? Viewer edition. Story one. I remember when I was still at primary school, we had a library where books weren't classified. No fantasy section, no history section. It was a jumble of books ordered by a lettering slash alphabetic system. When I was a second year, I'd issue a book, I'd issued a book that contained rather strong language. There were cuss words, suggestive sarcasm, sadistic themes, and detailed gore throughout the book portrayed in the form of kids' reading material. I found it absolutely hilarious, despite not understanding the majority of the topics. Don't know why a book like this was in a kid's library. I guess the teachers misunderstood the cover, though I cannot see how. At the end of the week, the teacher was asking kids if they'd like her to read their books to the class on library day, a day dedicated to reading. I, being completely oblivious, offered for her to read mine. Within the first few sentences, she was horrified. She took the book off me, told me the book fairy must have put the wrong book on the shelves, and then alerted the librarian and staff of the quote-unquote vulgar material. This all resulted in the whole library and books within it to be given a classification. An announcement was later in assembly about this, but no reason was given. Only a few friends of mine and I knew I was to blame. LOL. So, your school banned unclassified books, or not having a system to classify books. You know, I feel like we're going to read a lot of stories about dumb stuff that schools have banned, but... I'm pretty sure that's kind of a net positive because the old system that your school was doing it was bad. Story two. We went through three main office principals when I was in high school. The last wouldn't even show up to student government meetings when invited. Every time they tried to change the rule, there was a protest. Class of 91 here, by the way. Hats, colors, Walkman, just flat out ignore that one. There was talk about more changes coming, but we made a lot of noise. The year after I graduated, everything changed. Only seniors were allowed to leave campus. Nobody follows this rule. You have to stay in the lunchroom at lunchtime. No coats during class. Wear your IDs. The list goes on. It's like they gave up and figured they had a cutoff point where they could act and jumped on it. More recently, the change in passing time from five minutes to three minutes and restricted the number of times you can go to your locker. My kids were happy to be out of there. I have fond memories of high school. They all hated it. They turned our smoking patio into a parking lot, too, and did away with detention. There's a ticket and a fine for everything. I'm glad I went to school when I did. I don't know how I feel about schools fining kids. Like, 
<clears throat> that doesn't seem like something that should be within their authority to do. Like, even detention sometimes feels a little bit ridiculous to me, but fining kids? No, that's... No, stop that. Don't encourage... Don't encourage people to like... Uh, no, I hate that. Story three. I have a story. I don't remember what my school called it, and I was the one to blame for getting it banned. Basically, a bunch of kids would kick in someone else's knee and see the other kid's knee buckle down as a joke. It was very common in my high school. Someone saw that I was having a really bad day and thought the way to cheer me up was to do this trick on me and everything would be fine. However, I've had surgery on my knee twice, so forcing it to go in when it shouldn't did not go very well. Instead of making me feel better, it just made me drop my other knee crying and have me go to the hospital again to have my knee fixed. When I came back, it turns out the kid got a month worth of ISS and was also put on an insult list, probably spelled that wrong, and the game has been banned from the school. Great. I honestly felt bad for the guy because he was only doing it because he saw that I was having a really crappy day and he was trying to make me feel better. Really wish I saw him coming sooner so I could stop him before anything worse happened. Story 4. Mine banned leggings, jeggings, and yoga pants. By that time, like three quarters of my pants were either leggings or yoga pants. I find jeans uncomfortable, though they were all black or dark gray. Never got in trouble despite one of my deans supposedly being a huge stickler, and I was in their office a couple times a year. Also, supposedly unnatural hair colors were banned, but for my first three years, I saw an upperclassman whose hair was always like bubblegum pink. Though the stupidest was that marching band didn't count for P.E. credit, but it did count as one of the seven classes you were allowed to take with the regular band you were already a part of counting for another. Oh, and our scheduling was weird. So like in one semester, I was done with all my classes for the day at 11.30 a.m. and I only had two that day. But to others, I had straight 7.30 to 3.30 with no breaks for lunch. Yes, you were not guaranteed lunch, and you had to be on campus between 9.30 and 2.20, or between your first period starting and your last period ending. Thank God most of our teachers let us eat during class, and we were allowed laptops and phones. Story 5. We had a lot of things that were banned at my old high school. Piercings, men with long hair, beards, unnatural hair color, water bottles, different types of backpacks. The list goes on. The worst one, in my opinion, is the ban on personal electronic devices. I say ban in quotations because it wasn't technically banned, but the requirement to bring them was ridiculous. At the beginning of the year, everyone in my high school got brand new MacBooks from the school to use during class. They made us sign a contract basically stating, hey, don't try and search up anything not safe for work and don't try and circumvent the security system and don't break the laptop. However, afterwards, they gave us another contract regarding personal devices. It basically stated that if we wanted to bring in a personal device such as a phone or laptop, we were required to install the school's security software onto our device so they could have 100% control over the device or we could not bring it to school. The software itself allowed them full administrator access and remote access to your computer and allowed them to remotely add slash remove files, programs, and wipe your device without warning. As far as I know, nobody follows it anymore because a ton of parents got mad over it, but it's technically still in place. Good lord, that list at the beginning of all the things that your school banned, like, did you... Where did you go to school exactly? Did you happen to see Kevin Bacon dancing outside of it uh, ridiculously? Because your school sounds messed up. What the hell? Story 6. A high school in Elmont, Texas banned girls from having short hair. A girl came back from summer break with one-inch spiked hair and was suspended from school until it grew back. She sued the school for sexual discrimination and won several hundred thousand dollars. Exhibit A at the trial was a picture of the female superintendent with the exact same hairstyle except the superintendent's hair was dyed bright blue. The reason the student's hair was so short was that she had lost her hair over the summer from chemo treatment for cancer. The lawsuit got national attention and the superintendent got fired from her $350,000 job. The rule on girls' hair length was scrapped, and the only restriction was that it could not be dyed wild colors. I'm sorry, even if that girl didn't have chemo treatment and everything, 
not allowing girls to have short hair is wildly stupid. What a terrible rule. If I was a parent, I would be like, I would be furious. You, oh God, schools, stop telling kids what they can look like, especially based on gender, you a-holes. Story seven. Sometimes things will be banned for justifiable reasons, or at least understandable ones. There were two middle schools in my hometown that banned carrying backpacks to class after a lethal school shooting. I attended in the mid-2000s, but this was some years prior. However, the one high school in town that did not have this rule, as the school did not have lockers, so the students had to carry their bag, why no lockers? To stop students selling drugs at school. Story 8. Backpacks at lunch. I was in high school. Some kids would go around selling candy, school supplies, etc. out of their backpacks to get lunch money. No big deal. Almost everyone got approval from the staff to do so. Emphasis on the almost. There was one guy who was selling, let's just say, less than savory items out of his backpack. So they banned all of them for a week, then rescinded the ban when said student got expelled. Story 9. Cell phones. In my sophomore year of high school, my school started doing a personal device policy since they want to start doing more digital learning in the classroom. Included in the list of approved devices were cell phones as long as you didn't text, use social media, or anything else that wasn't appropriate in class. Come my junior year, phones were banned. Why? Turns out the senior class the year before abused the hell out of the policy since it was going to be their only year in high school where they could have their phones in class. Thanks, class of 2015. You know, back when I went to school, they did not prohibit students from having cell phones. That was totally fine. But that's because when I was in high school, nobody had cell phones. I did, and I think one other person in school that I knew of did, because it wasn't really a thing, and it was big. It was, it, it, my cell phone was large enough that I could have fought someone with it. <laughs> Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.